An elderly lady was amazed at how nice the young man was next door to her. Every day, she would help him. He would help her gather things from her car and help her bring in groceries, help her with the yard work, and just generally help her whenever she needed help. And one day, the old lady finally asked the young man, Son, how did you become such a fine young man? And the young man replied, Well, when I was a boy, I had a drug problem. The old lady was shocked. I can't believe that. Oh, it's true, the young man replied. My parents drugged me to church every Sunday morning, drugged me to Sunday school, and drugged me to confirmation classes. This weekend in the church year is the one we call Trinity Sunday. And it is usually the weekend that we pull out the third of the three so-called ecumenical creeds. Ecumenical, a word that means that among Christians, it's something that is very nearly universally accepted as a form of confession of faith, no matter what church, congregation, or denomination. The three ecumenical creeds are the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. And while all three give us the words of confessing the Holy Trinity, the Athanasian Creed takes a deep dive into articulating what we mean by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No matter what creed we use to confess our faith, the name of the Holy Trinity is vital to our Christian religion. We do not have a God who is distant. We do not have a God who is murky. We do not have a God who lingers in the shadows. We do not have a God who is unknowable. Instead, we have a God who is personable. We have a God who comes among us, lives among us, becomes one of us. We have an intimate, close relationship with God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is the God in whose name we make disciples. And we are made disciples. We are made his children. We make people his children when we are baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity and we baptize others in the name of the Holy Trinity. The name of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Not just an identifier. The name of God, the name of the Holy Trinity is not just what we call him. The name of the Holy Trinity is powerful. The name of God is who he is. For instance, in the name of Jesus, a lame man is healed. Look at Acts 3. Salvation is in the name of Jesus. Look at Romans 10. The name of Jesus gives us joy. Look at John 16. The name of the Lord is a defense against evil. Proverbs 18. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow at the end of all things. Philippians 4. And as I said, in the name of Jesus, disciples are made. The mission of the church, that is, every Christian church on earth, is to make disciples. Jesus gave us this great commission because we're all in it together. At the same time that he promised that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. And then Jesus ascended into heaven where he intercedes for us prepares a place for us, and from where he sends us this Holy Spirit. But how exactly do we get and go about carrying out the great commission of Jesus? Well, we do this, we make disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Or as Martin Luther said, to be baptized in God's name is to be baptized not by men, but by God himself. Therefore, although it is performed by human hands, it is still God's own work. In baptism, God puts his saving name on us and is truly present to bless us with all his gifts as his children and heirs. But notice that Jesus doesn't stop with baptism. That's the first step. 
in the process of making disciples. The next step is teaching. Where and how does this happen? Well, there are many ways. There is teaching that happens in Sunday school. Children are taught by dedicated and faithful teachers about Jesus and the Bible. They are taught songs that typically stay with them for the rest of their lives. If you went to Sunday school, I bet you can remember and even sing right now your favorite song from when you were a little kid. And at St. Matthew and in many congregations like ours, there is a teaching that goes on in an early childhood center or in a day school. Again, dedicated and faithful teachers teach children about Jesus and the Bible. That's been a tremendous blessing here at St. Matthew from virtually the very beginning of our congregation. And in my own ministry, it has been an honor to serve with so many faithful and dedicated teachers. Every summer, there is a special opportunity to teach others about Jesus, especially children, in what is known as Vacation Bible School. St. Matthew has a Vacation Bible School, or a VBS as it's also known, each summer. Music, crafts, games, lots and lots of fun, and of course, learning about Jesus is a part of every VBS each summer. And by the way, the origins of VBS are close to home for us because it was in Hopedale, Illinois, near Peoria in 1894 that the first VBS was thought to have been started by a public school teacher who felt that she did not have enough time during the school year to teach people about Jesus, so she set up a special school session during the summer break to teach children about Jesus. Today, you're not allowed to teach Jesus about about children about Jesus in the public schools, so VBS is of utmost importance for the teaching of children about Jesus in today's world. Another vital important teaching ministry is the youth ministry. And this is one that has been a challenge for us here at St. Matthew. But we are constantly working towards building this important aspect of teaching young people about Jesus. You're going to hear more about that in the months to come. And then there's the tried and true Bible study, adult Bible study. Here at St. Matthew, our adult Bible studies are geared as they are extensions of what happens here in worship. Because in Bible study, we have the opportunity to more intimately look at and explore what is said here in the worship service. We can take deep dives into the text of God's Word, like we are going to do this fall when we pick up our Bible studies again in the book of Revelation on Sundays and Galatians on Saturdays, just to name two. This is how we participate in the process of making disciples that Jesus commands us to do in the Great Commission, to baptize and to teach. And then Jesus gives us an incredible word of encouragement as we go on this mission. Jesus tells us that he is with us always, even to the end of the age. And what do you get from that statement of Jesus? And I think there are at least two ways to look at this. I think it's a good thing, it's an encouraging promise, but also you could look at this as a threat. It's a good thing in this. There is no place that we can go that Jesus will not be with us. And I got a Bible passage that shows exactly this, that I hope provides great comfort for you. Psalm 139, verses 7, 8, and 9. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, or the grave, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning, or dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Jesus is always with you, wherever you go. You are never alone. How comforting that is. When it's 2 o'clock in the morning, you can't sleep, you are alone, you're wide awake, alone, Afraid, maybe, miserable that there's no one else around there for you, but Jesus is there with you. Hang on to that promise. But this promise, this comment of Jesus, this announcement that I will be with you always can also be, well, it's a good thing, but it can also be somewhat of a threat. I saw a skit in college almost 35 years ago that stuck with me to this day. I continue to think about this. It was just, it was like a talent show type of thing that some of the students did this little skit and it was about a, a young lady who 
would go about her daily life. She'd sit in the chapel pews for chapel time. She'd be in biology class. She'd be in the library studying for her English test. And everywhere she went in her daily life, there was somebody with her. And that person was representing Jesus. No matter where she went, chapel, library, dorm room, wherever it was, classroom, Jesus was with her. And then her friends came up and said, hey, let's go out. Let's go out and have a good time at one of the local drinking establishments. Well, she realized she didn't always want Jesus to be with her. Not always. She didn't want Jesus to go into places like that. So she took out a hammer and nailed Jesus to a cross so he would stay right there so she could go off with her friends. But Jesus promises that he will always be with us. Now, make no mistake. You who are listening to this message, you sitting in this church right now or online, on your couch, you are very much involved in the mission of the church to make disciples. But pastor, you're the one that's supposed to be doing the baptizing. That's your job, not mine. I don't baptize people. Well, if you have a hymnal, and I know that here in the room you do, if you look at the second to last page of the hymnal, it's page 1023. Who knew there were over a thousand pages in that hymnal? On that second to last page is the rite of baptism in case of emergency. There are times when you'll want to make sure that a person is a child of God in the waters of holy baptism and a pastor just can't get there in time. You can do it. Because the great commission of Jesus to baptize and teach and make disciples is given to the church, not just to the pastors in the church. There was a family in my previous church who were expecting the birth of their daughter. And the pregnancy was going fine up until labor started and then complications arose. And the child was born, but there was some serious doubt whether this child was going to survive for very long. And I couldn't get there in what they felt like how much time they had. So, as the child was born, they were going to whisk her off into the NICU. And the father of that child asked for some water and quickly baptized his daughter right there in the delivery room. Now that story has a happy ending no matter what the ending happens to be because that child is now a child of God and there is without a doubt that God saves us through baptism. But actually this story has a better, uh, not a better, but a different kind of happy ending. The child survived and grew and thrived and after three months they were able to bring her home and the following Sunday this family brought her to church and we didn't re-baptize her because she is already baptized once and you only need to be baptized once in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we, in that church service, recognized the emergency baptism and there was great rejoicing in the church service that day. Now, Jesus talks about baptism going hand in hand with teaching. But you don't have to be a teacher to teach about Jesus. Oh, you could lecture people like a teacher and that's not always a bad thing. There are some teachers that I have had that I could sit and listen to them lecture day, all day long. There are others, no, and I'd rather not, and uh, not all lectures are bad, but there are other ways to teach about Jesus. For most of us, the better way to teach about Jesus is to show people Jesus through your life. Like the young man with the drug problem at the beginning of this message, what is ingrained in us in an early age comes out of our lives when we're older. And if we have Jesus taught to us, shared with us, and poured out into us at a younger age, or at any age really, then we will truly be able to live. We will be able to live with Christ living in us, always with us, and that will open up the best ways to go out into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching them. Let me close this with this story about going out into the world to tell others about Jesus. A missionary to Africa tells the story of an elderly woman who was reached with the gospel, but she was blind, and she could neither read nor write, 
and yet she wanted to share her newfound faith with others. So she went to the ministry, the missionary, and asked for a Bible in French. And when she got it, she asked the missionary, would you underline John 3.16 for me, and then mark the page so I know where it is in the Bible. And the missionary was, did that and was very curious about what she was going to do with this. And so one day she followed her, and that elderly lady, in the afternoon, went to where the school was, and as school was being let out, she made her way to the front door. The boys were coming out when the school was dismissed, and she would stop one and ask if that young boy knew how to read French. And if she got a yes, she would ask him, read this verse that's underlined in my Bible. Remember, she's blind. And so the young boy would read the verse, and then she would ask, do you know what it means? And then she would tell him, the young boy, about Christ. The missionary went on to say that there were 24 young boys that this lady did this to in that school, and they all became pastors when they got older. Baptize, teach. Jesus is always with you, and you will be fulfilling the great commission of Jesus with your life. In Jesus' name, amen.